Good morning, everyone. So have you ever wondered if it is possible to raise a healthy vegan family? So today I'm with Dr. Vikan Patel. He's a plant-based uh, pediatrician, um, and he's going to share today's from his clinical practice. He'll touch upon the different nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that we need to be mindful of uh, on a vegan-based plant diet, according to guidelines from the Canadian Pediatric Society and the Canada Food Guidelines. And the hope is to encourage you and your families to explore this research lifestyle approach and to incorporate more vegetables in general into your child's uh, diet. So Dr. Regan Patel is born and raised in the Kitchen, uh, Kitchen Waterloo region in Ontario. He is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at University of Toronto. He completed his PEDS residency at Memorial um, and a master's in health policy and finance from the London School of Economics uh, and the London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He currently works for Scarborough Health Network, and he's a founding member of the Mark and Kids Clinic, where he actively discusses plant-based nutrition interventions for children and teenagers. So welcome, uh, Dr. Regan Patel. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks for having me today. So how are things going for you this morning? Good. It's, uh, it's a little gloomy in Toronto, but uh, the weather's still been pretty, uh, pretty nice. So uh, yeah, I know everything's going well. So it's wonderful for you to meet with us today, you know, to share your insights, you know, as kids are going, you know, back to school, getting back to routine and, you know, parents have been uh, talking to me for a long time about nutrition options for kids. And so I guess that's how we'll start today is um, exploring the work that you've, the experience that you have working with families and plant-based nutrition. All right. Well, thank you so much. And again, thanks for having me today. It's nice to uh, connect every with everyone out on the east coast of Canada. I'm sure that's probably a majority of the people would be tuning in, but from anywhere else in the world, now that so much can be done virtually, uh, such as something like this. And uh, so today I'll be, I'm going to be talking about how we can consider raising healthy children on a plant-based diet. Now, a plant-based diet can take on different meanings for different people. And so I'll just talk about exactly what a plant-based diet is first. For some people that may uh, consist of just a vegetarian diet and a vegetarian diet refers to no animal products, but they uh, may eat um, dairy. They could eat eggs. Uh, then the kind of after that, a plant-based diet, there's, you know, the spectrum would be a vegan diet. And a vegan diet refers to no animal products at all. So that would also include uh, not having any dairy in the diet, not having any eggs or fish. So again, there's a spectrum. And a plant-based diet has been discussed for a long, long time now in the adult population, but it now more than ever is becoming more relevant in the pediatric population. And I work with that population every day, pretty much right from birth up to 18 years old, because it's a practical and intervention for addressing uh, growing concerns in children such as obesity. Uh, children now are finding to have higher cholesterol levels, higher blood pressure, uh, and even diabetes. So they're all very, this, uh, changing this one thing can, can be a solution to so many other growing health concerns right now uh, with, and with everything really on the rise. So what I'm going to do, I'm really hoping to share with you information that's going to be useful to uh, you, not only yourself and hopefully your loved ones. And I've been really passionate about this topic now for the last 15 years when I adopted a plant-based diet. A plant-based diet has been discussed for a long, long time now in the adult population, but it now more than ever is becoming more relevant in the pediatric population. And I work with that population every day, pretty much right from birth up to 18 years old, because it's a practical and intervention for addressing uh, growing concerns in children such as obesity. Uh, children now are finding to have higher cholesterol levels, higher blood pressure, uh, and even diabetes. So they're all very, this, uh, changing this one thing can, can be a solution to so many other growing health concerns right now uh, with, and with everything really on the rise. So, 
what I'm going to do, I'm really hoping to share with you information that's going to be useful to uh, you, not only yourself and hopefully your loved ones. And I've been really passionate about this topic now for the last 15 years when I adopted a plant-based diet. And at that time that I did, I met a group of people that really inspired me to take this up. And more so at that time, it was for lifestyle reasons. I didn't do it for any of the health benefits. But now it's a welcome bonus to see the science support so many of the things that I've been doing for a long time. And that's one of the reasons I've been really passionate about it. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to share my screen right now to um, show a slide. All right. So what I wanted, this is a really fitting picture to start with. And this is a few years back or just recently the Canada Food Guidelines changed their, their approach to uh, basically what they considered a balanced diet. And one of the things that was really notable on here was the fact that pretty much uh, the word uh, protein was, or the, sorry, meat was removed and it was just changed to protein sources. And one of the things that was uh, very clearly noted was that both milk, the word milk and meat were removed. And I think this is a really big deal because these Canada food guidelines were based on scientific evidence. And you can imagine that the meat and the dairy industries, they're very, very uh, large lobbies, uh, not only just in Canada, but in every part of the world. So to, as you can see from this picture, what I wanted to point out was that half the plate here is focusing on uh, of a balanced diet is fruits and vegetables. The other quarter is whole grains. And now the other uh, quarter here is protein food sources, right? So again, I just really wanted to emphasize here now 75%, you know, three quarters of this plate is, 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 is basically non protein, non protein sources for diet. And Again, I just wanted to say that that's a really big, um, you know, a really big victory here for uh, those that are considering uh, not only plant, just a plant-based diet, but just, again, fighting the heavy pressures from lobbies um, that, that exist in the, the dairy and the meat industry. So the most common question that I would get asked by families is, if I'm going to switch over to either a vegetarian or a vegan uh, type of diet, how is my child going to get enough protein? So I want to address kind of that myth. And again, the next, uh, I'm also going to just share my next uh, slide here because it's also one that I think is important to see. And but, we can, uh, where, where I find it helpful too, is that so many parents tell me they have really picky children. And so a lot of kids, even if it's maybe not, avoiding meat for the whatever reasons that they just don't, but they're not eating it because they don't like it. So it's so wonderful to have options for them, how you can still get adequate protein, even if your child doesn't like to eat meat. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I usually, the first thing that I tell parents about just picky eaters in general is that first of all, it's very normal, especially when they're younger and they're still coming onto solid foods. Uh, particularly, we really notice it around the ages of like two, even all the way up to like five, six, seven, where kids can be picky. And a lot of it is just consistency, showing the same food over and over again and not being discouraged by the fact that they may not want to take it when we want them to take it. So I always tell parents just a, a kind of a rule of thumb in general for introducing food is that we offer it to the children and they are allowed to make the choice, but we don't force it upon them because we want eating for them to be a positive experience. Um, so here, what I wanted to show is, this is with permission with one of my patients from the office, is a growth chart of a, a mom who is vegan and raising their infant, um, raising their uh, infant who is also a, now a vegan. And this is pretty much an infant who is 18 months old. And we can see, so I, I'll just explain this growth chart. On the bottom he, here is going to be the weight curve. And on the top is the, the height curve. Uh, for those that may have not seen a chart like this before, but probably most have with their, their younger children. And again, I wanted to show you here that as pediatricians, the reason why we use these growth charts to uh, uh, that are so important is because they give us an objective measure for uh, health and well-being. So again, height and weight being important measures 
uh, when kids are in their growing phases of life. So we see here that this vegan baby, mom breastfed for a little while, then switched uh, over to a soy-based formula. And now this kid is doing really well on a variety of uh, plant-based foods serving as their protein sources. So I wanted to show here that we can see that this this uh, this infant is on the 50th to 85th percentile for their height and weight. And again, just emphasizing to everyone who's watching this that this uh, uh, infant here who is a vegan is very healthy and doing well. So I'm gonna just share some specific points around specific uh, nutrients and minerals that often, often come into question when we're considering a plant-based diet. So I'll, and I'll also be touching upon uh, specific topics for moms who may be uh, breastfeeding and looking, at, looking for milk alternatives for their infants. So again, as we mentioned, the, the protein myth, I think it's important, it, can we get enough? And the question is absolutely from a plant-based diet. The one important thing to recognize with protein specifically is that plant-based protein has lower digestibility than animal-based protein. So typically it's just recommended that if you're on a plant-based diet, you need about 15 to about 30% more protein, depending on the age of your child, compared to non-vegetarians. And the second thing to remember with uh, protein, if you're considering a plant-based uh, type of diet, uh, is, is essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are our building blocks for, for, um, for growth. And so the take-home message here is that if you're on a plant-based diet, and now if you're on a, a vegetarian diet and you're taking uh, dairy sources, all of your essential amino acids will be con will be covered with dairy. But again, if you're if you're not having dairy, then you just have to ensure that there's a variety of plant-based proteins so that the essential amino acids complement each other. And again, foods to consider would be lentils, whole grain breads, pumpkin seeds, a variety of nut butters, um, you know, soya. So again, there's a lot of choice to choose from. And one thing I wanted to put out there is there's research from the American uh, Dietitian Association, and they've showed that meat-based diets, in fact, have protein levels that are far beyond our daily requirements. And it's a lot of times these meat-based products now that have been strongly correlated to uh, conditions such as heart disease, higher cholesterol levels, um, obesity, diabetes. So again, uh, most diet, most diets that are meat-based, they're getting more protein than they need, and it can very easily be done on a plant-based diet um, if we're just a little bit mindful and thoughtful about making some food combinations. And I think you know the meat-based too. Like you know, we have, you know, I, I know last year when I was at Nashville, um, we had I went to the obesity conference, and there is this controversy. There's like this vegan approach, and there's the meat-based approach. But I think what it comes down to is having a well-structured meal plan. You know, because I, I, I do see people do well eating meat, but it's how you structure your meals, how you structure your day. You know, and I think there, there's a lot of fads out there, right? And, you know, one of the reasons I want to talk about this, because I think a vegan diet for some can be a fad as well. But mm -hmm. if it's not structured properly, then you might miss out on those minerals. And so um, it's, that's why it's great to hear you kind of talk about what are those key nutrients that we need. And that when you know, people look at feeding their children and feeding themselves, being mindful to what it is, like you know, putting real food in your mouth, I think is the most important thing. You know, avoiding things that come from, um, what does Mark Hyman says? He says, if it comes from a plant, don't eat it. But if, if it grows in the ground as a plant, then you can eat it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's what it's a big point to emphasize is that this is not an all or nothing approach. It can be done gradually, but really what I feel that a plant-based uh, diet shifting towards more uh, fruits and vegetables in general, what it helps promote is just more thoughtfulness and consideration for what we're putting in our bodies as it's just a starting point. Um, so then what I'm going to move on to is the iron question. Now, the iron question definitely comes up a lot with uh, people who are looking to explore more of a plant-based diet, and 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 rightfully so, because iron deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency in children. So that's an important thing to remember. But and iron is so important for for younger uh, infants. It's really important for their early brain development, 
And it's also important for red blood cell formation. So that ensures that we have adequate oxygen transport through our, throughout our body. And, and so that's why pretty much every single company, food company out there, they've uh, tried, you can see when you look at anything from a, on a package, it says iron fortified cereals, grains, dried beans, peas, right? Because they, they're, they know how important it is and all the all co food companies know that they have to fortify with iron because of how important it is. Now, remember with the plant-based side, the, important, the really important thing to remember for iron is uh, that iron sources from usually plant-based diets are non-heme uh, sources and heme iron is what is absorbed in the body. So the important thing to remember is that iron uh, from plant-based sources need to be combined with sources of vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is a cofactor. What it does is that it converts the non-heme to the heme iron, which helps the gut absorb the iron. So uh, the, the research shows that about anywhere from about 25 to 100 milligrams of vitamin C per meal uh, has shown to increase absorption of iron by four times. And so what that looks like in, re in, in practical day-to-day -day life is that if you're having, let's say, a bowl of chili, um, that it could be with beans, you're adding something like tomatoes or bell peppers that are high in the vitamin C that are gonna help you absorb that iron. So again, the take home message for iron is that you can definitely get enough iron in a plant-based diet. However, it's important that you, it, we figure out how we're taking that iron. So again, uh, it's important to take it with that vitamin C. Um, and just for people that are wondering about sources of, of iron, you can get that in uh, dark uh, green leafy vegetables, dried fruits, lentil, beans, again, whole grains. Uh, and then the way you would want to do that with vitamin C is you could think about like oatmeal with fruit, or again, as we mentioned, chili with, chili with uh, tomatoes or bell peppers, um, spinach salad with strawberries in it. Again, I'm just giving you guys some practical ideas. Um, because again, food combination is always where people need to sit and think a little bit. Um, the next uh, vitamin that I wanted to go through is B12. So no doubt uh, this is a common deficiency for those that are on a plant-based uh, diet. And because B12 is mainly found in animal products, uh, eggs, and dairy. So if you are a uh, lacto or an ovo vegetarian, that's okay. You're going to get your B12. Uh, and B12, the reason why it's so important is because for our, our nerve tissue, our early brain development, it also has a role in our red blood cell uh, production. And, and when we don't get enough B12, it could lead to uh, poor growth. It could, in, in infants, we may notice uh, delay in our gross motor development or even some regression in milestones. And uh, in older kids, it can be seen as anemia when we're lacking in B12. So again, the, 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 the take-home point with B12 is that uh, B12 typically will come fortified in foods. So look for it in fortified cereals, juices, uh, it's in um, soy milk, uh, tofu and tempeh. And if that is not enough, if you're not getting it enough in your diet, you can always take it as a supplement as, you know, five to 10 micrograms per day. And that's why this, there's, a, there's a saying that uh, I talk about amongst my dietitian uh, colleagues, five to 10 micrograms per day keep uh, away mus neuromuscular delay. Uh, the next uh, nutrient that I want to talk about is omega-3. So fat Thank you. Brain development, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So just when we think about vitamin B12, we should think about just our, our nerve tissues, our brain development, our, our motor milestones. And uh, it's just a simple way to remember the dosing amount for how much we need in a day. Uh, so the next one that I want to talk about is fatty acids and omega-3. So omega-3s, as many, most people know, are really important for our eyes, our brain, and it also helps reduce inflammation. Now, vegan diets or plant-based diets can be deficient in specifically the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, so DHA and EPA. And that's the reason why is because that's mainly found in seafood and eggs. And so because, for example, I mean, again, if you're having seafood and eggs, no problem, you're getting your omega-3s. But for those that may be on a fully plant-based or vegan diet, it's really important 
uh, to consider like sea vegetables or algae where that's found. And so that's why we would really recommend uh, adequate sources uh, for, for people who are on a full plant-based diet would be um, flaxseed and canola oils, walnuts, soy products, because they're going to have linolenic, uh, sorry, linolenic acid. And that is the precursor for DHA and EPA that we need um, that can be converted to those. So again, thinking about uh, there are vegan play, uh, based DHA supplements. There's also uh, algae based oils. Uh, and one thing to remember with omega-3s is that there's no uh, DRI, which means dietary reference intake. So there's no specific amount that's been deemed uh, the amount that we need. But again, if we are looking for a plant-based, uh, towards a plant-based diet, it's important to consider these oils that I mentioned, soy products, walnuts, as the precursors, and if not, getting it as a supplement. And actually, Rika, that's the one supplement I do recommend a lot of families have for their children because you know the more and more the research that we see in terms of omega threes, cardiac protection, you yeah. know, brain health, and a lot of kids, no matter what, like they're just not eating, they're not eating the seafood, they're not getting it maybe from like a vegan source. Um, so is that something too? Like you have specific supplements that you will recommend to to patients for for something like this? Yeah, there are. I mean, again, I, I definitely can't keep up with the number of companies and uh, and companies that are coming out with different supplements. And so typically, uh, you know, I'm just directing people if, again, if they're not having the different oils that uh, we recommend, is to look out specifically for uh, a DHA-based um, uh, oil or an algae-based supplement, and they're going to have uh, everything that we need. So, like for example, for myself, uh, I mean, although I I eat the foods, I'll still also take it as a powder that I have in my like water or juice in the morning. Like different phytoplanktons and things like that. I know can yeah. anything can really that says. Anything that says E3 Live, so E3 Live is specifically an algae-based supplement. Uh, anything that you say uh, that says E3 Live will have everything that we need. Um, and then, so the, the other nutrient that I wanted to talk about was calcium. So if my, for people who are on a vegan diet, they may ask, if I don't eat dairy, how am I going to get my calcium? So the first thing to remember is that uh, you having low calcium is a possibility if you're on a strictly plant-based diet, but it's really important to remember that there's so many other foods that we get calcium from that are, that are from aside from milk. The big ones being like broccoli, uh, uh, leafy greens, uh, bok choy, Chinese cabbage, kale, collars. These are all really high, high bioavailable sources of calcium for our children and our older children. And I always like to leave my patients with a fun fact that uh, a sweet potato, which I consider a superfood, has 68 milligrams of calcium. Uh, and not only that, it's rich in potassium, vitamin A and C. So again, there's so many different cool foods that I, uh, power, superpower foods that have calcium besides dairy. So we know for sure that you can get enough calcium um, outside of having dairy sources. And that's so important because, you know, I find a lot of families when they transition their kids off of breast milk, you know, and they say, well, my kid doesn't like cow's milk. Well, I say, well, because cow's milk was made for a cow, <laughs> you know, not for human consumption. But when you look at the other sources, it's so important that there's plenty of ways to get calcium other than through, uh, through dairy options. Yeah. And I just want to mention with calcium, the important thing to remember with calcium is that you need vitamin D to absorb calcium, right? So it's, uh, it's really also important because we all, I mean, pretty much anywhere in Canada, uh, we live in parts of the world where we're not getting maybe as much sun exposure for natural and vitamin D production. So I even recommend even to my younger family, like my younger infants for ones that are on formula where we know that there may be enough vitamin D, if you want to get take a vitamin C supplement, I usually have no problems with that because it's very rare to hit high vitamin D levels. And so there's really no downside to taking vitamin D supplement and it's going to help you absorb your calcium. So I just wanted to put out there that if you are, um, 
you know, if you are strictly going to consider like a vegan or plant-based diet, that you need vitamin D2, um, and that's ergocalciferol, uh, to have that fortified in your diet, again, to promote the vitamin, um, sorry, the calcium um, absorption. So again, as we mentioned, we talked about a few foods, um, soy milk, uh, turnip greens, uh, tofu and kale, a whole bunch of like nuts, seeds, beans, they're all high in calcium. Uh, and now just wanted to finish off with my, for my breastfeeding moms who are vegans. Uh, it's really important for breastfeeding moms who, uh, who want to raise their children as vegans. Uh, it's now recommended that all um, uh, pregnant or lactating moms, they take in 2000 international units of vitamin D uh, through the winter months to maintain adequate vitamin D levels. And uh, this is also true for, for our plant-based moms. It's also important to consider their iron um, supplementation during pregnancy. And also specifically because of the, how significant the role is of our essential fatty acids for eye and brain development to really make sure that if you are gonna be a, a plant-based um, vegan mom who's uh, breastfeeding, to also not, to not forget about our uh, our essential fatty acids, as well as our B12 that we talked about earlier. Um, I'm just gonna share one more slide that I think would be important for families to see. Uh, and just from the vitamin D perspective, we can like, you know, that's one of the things I advocate, you know, across Canada, the recommendation for the most part is a thousand international units because most people here are not getting the vitamin D. And you know, <laughs> And the younger you can supplement when you get that bone growth as it's being laid down, that's going to reduce that lifelong risk of, you know, osteoporosis and osteopenia. So a great thing to mention for vegan moms, but for basically for everybody. Right. <laughs> Vitamin D. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then going to this here, a lot of people may wonder, like, what am I going to do for my child after I stop breastfeeding, right? Especially if you're looking for vegan-based uh, milk alternatives. Now, uh, this is from a, a dietitian colleague of mine. And typically the recommendation is a soy formula until the age of two. That is a perfectly viable, healthy alternative. And what I wanted to show, highlight uh, specifically here is that a lot of people may um, consider like almond milk, coconut milk, cashew milk, rice milk, all these different things. But it's really soy milk here that's specifically the closest to whole milk in terms of its nutritional content. So we look here specifically at the, the, the fat content, but also specifically we see here that the protein content for almond, coconut, cashew, the protein content is very low and soy milk is the closest to our whole milk. So generally we would say that um, if you're not wanting to breastfeed, that soy milk, that soy formula is our uh, recommended alternative if you're looking to have your uh, infant completely uh, on a plant-based alternative. And again, coming into that essential protein, you know, and I think um, it's so key from a child's perspective, but adults as well, you know, it's, and uh, how you started it all off with making sure we get that essential protein. Um, yeah, and then, so just to end, what I'm gonna do is just uh, take people through a, a couple of uh, just suggestions for if they're looking to make um, some, some tips to switch. I think it's really important that families identify three or four um, plant-based or vegetarian recipes that the whole family can enjoy. And I think what that involves, first of all, starting off what we're eating and seeing how we can substitute for uh, plant-based alternatives. So again, um, you know, using uh, beans, lentils, legumes, tofu, tempeh, as a, opposed to our protein meat sources. I think the second tip that I'd also like to recommend is just to consider broadening our food options. It's really fun. And I think one of the best ways to bond as a family is to learn how to like cook together in addition to what we're always recommending in pediatrics is to have family meals, right? And uh, I think this is a really, uh, I, I tell parents all the time, I said, really let the kids share with what's exciting them and what they really are interested in and try to you know, work around that. I think it really makes it a fun interactive experience for them. 
The third thing I'd like to, uh, you know, suggest in terms of uh, a tip is choosing a low fat uh, option wherever possible. So, you know, looking at um, something like pasta with marinara sauce instead of uh, meatballs, um, you know, again, there's so many different looking at different types of, uh, um, you know, looking at, we know that our, our soy based uh, uh, options have a lot less fat content uh, than, than the meat. So again, just thinking about low fat options, because uh, all our plant based, um, you know, with our plant based uh, choices, the nuts, uh, the, the plant-based, the nutsy butters, they're all very good in the fats that we need. It's just specifically uh, the, the tremendous benefit of considering more of a plant-based diet is that it's really much lower in the saturated fats, the fats that we want to avoid in our diet, right? Well, and, you know, on that point, that's where I think the vegan and, you know, non-meat diets because I, you know, I'm, I really follow carbohydrates as well, carbohydrate sources. And, you know, when I've looked at a vegan diet, one of the things that I see, because it's very high in carbs and people can do very well on it, but when they combine the carbs with the saturated fat as a vegan alternative, that's when they run into trouble. Mm -hmm. Whereas from a, the fat perspective, if you keep your carbs really low, um, I find people can do okay. <laughs> so it's, you know, and I think a lot of it too comes down and you would probably agree that it's the choice of what we're having and the quantity and the quality that we have, right? Because, you know, for, for a pasta, if I, you know, I made one the other night with the kids and we had zucchini noodles in it and we had, we did have some, there was some uh, animal protein, but it was, you know, grass fed, small amounts. Mm -hmm. um, but when people are having many times like a vegetarian based, they'll have, you know, they'll fill it with lots of fat, but it actually, it's going to be white pasta, but without the vegetables, without the nutrients. So it really, I think it's, it's the education that people need. And so many times, you know, I see friends that choose a vegan option, but when I do their blood work, they may not be meeting, you know, I look at their, you know, their cholesterol profile and sure they're not eating a lot of fat, but they're still not getting the micronutrients that they need from all the vegetables because for some people, vegetarian just means, you know, a lot of white bread and white pasta, but we both know that it's all the micronutrients that you have to get from vegetables. You know, plants can provide us with almost, you know, everything that we need, um, but it's really looking at the, um, the quantity of them and, and what quality we're getting. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I very much agree. And, and I, I will always share this story because when I was in residency uh, and my, all my colleagues, they, they were always interested. They're like, what is Dr. Patel having for, you know, lunch or dinner today? Because it was usually the most colorful meal for sure amongst my, my colleagues and they were fascinated. So I was always sharing my food openly. My, my friends and colleagues all know this. And, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of education because as I was, you know, because as it was just part of my daily life, I was always sharing it just not, uh, you know, to change people, but just as a way to educate people. And, and I could see just over time, people were becoming more open-minded, trying things. When they would try something, they would be excited to tell me about it and, and how they thought it totally broke some of their, you know, misconceptions or, you know, ideologies that they had in their mind. So... So yeah, and then the last point that I wanted to to make is just trying to avoid beverages that are, um, you know, that have added sugar, fat, and salt, all things that uh, will be found uh, more so in animal-based proteins and things that are more easily avoided if we're looking to increase the, the amount of fruits and vegetables in our diet. So, so just to finally wrap up, um, you know, a, a well-based plant I'm sorry, a well-balanced plant-based diet. It's definitely endorsed not only by our Canadian Pediatric Society, it's the American um, Dietitians Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics. So there's so many bo bodies now that really are embracing and becoming more open-minded to uh, a, a plant-based diet. And so I feel I just want to recommend to people who are listening or who may be listening in the future that I think it is important to, if you're wanting to make the switch, to do it with an informed physician and a registered dietitian. I think that's really important. 
And so our office, we are trying to, we have that kind of team structure set up as well. And, and I would be myself happy if anyone was interested that uh, we can definitely, I feel like now more than ever in the era that we're in that uh, virtual consults are becoming more uh, you know, prevalent. So even though I'm here in Toronto, I'm happy to help people over the Ontario Telehealth Network uh, to set up a, um, a virtual consult to help talk about this more specifically for your family and situation. Yeah, it's a wonderful weekend because I think, you know, as physicians, when we can have that open dialogue with patients, that is so important. And many times, well, I, you know, I know in your experience and mine as well, you know, we're some of the few, right? We're the docs that actually talk to patients about food. But when we see food healing people, how can we not talk about it? Um, but I find there is that lack of resources in the medical community. Uh, of and even sometimes the dietitians they may not be as familiar with you know the vegan sources of, of protein so it's wonderful that your clinic's able you know to do consults because um, I think there may be some um, patients in the local area that would like to speak with you I know lately there's a lot of you know teenage athletes because some of the movies and things that have been out lately the documentaries that are really trying to switch to plant-based and I think it's having that well-constructed plan that's really important and, um, and finding like the, the biggest thing I've found over the past five years, switching more, more plant-based is being so creative with meals, you know, and coming up with substitutions of things that I would have never eaten before. Like, you know, cauliflower is one of my best friends now because I can eat it so many different ways, yeah. you know, and you know, your veggies and your greens. And, um, so it's been so wonderful to hear all of your tips of, um, how this can work for children. Yeah, it's a, it's really a fun process. I think for any family that's considering it, I'd say go for it because your health will benefit tremendously. I know that, uh, but I always tell parents that, you know, with, with children specifically, we want to, you know, a lot of times children want to make changes, but they, they do really need the support of the parents. And so role modeling is really, really important here. And, uh, I definitely say that please try it yourself and we're happy to support you in, in any way we can. There's some really great resources that I will pass on um, to, to uh, Dr. Keenan. And so I'm happy for her to share them with you for online based resources. And yeah, we're happy to continue the conversation at another, another point. So thank you. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. And I have the feeling we'll be talking again in the future. We've got uh, all kinds of ideas to kind of share for, for parents and for families. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I remember when, when I, actually, I also spent time working in New Brunswick when I was in uh, residency in, in Newfoundland. We had a chance to do a month of community pediatrics. So I spent a month in Moncton. So it gave me a chance to explore all over the East Coast. And uh, I really enjoyed my time in New Brunswick and just the East Coast in general. So it's a, it's a special place for myself. And if we can help that uh, part of Canada, I, I'd be really happy to. Well, I think, you know, COVID has done many things on many levels, but the one we would all agree with is that it is bringing us more together, you know, even though it may be virtually, but we're reaching out a lot more than before. Sure. All right. Well, thank you once again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. We'll talk yeah, soon. Thank, thank you so much, Tiffany, and, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. We, uh, we're really honored to have you here, and uh, we look forward to staying in touch.